So this video is about Berger's Vortex. Berger's Vortex is a simple model for uh, a common kind of vortex which is maintained by a balance between strain and viscosity. So we have strain pulling on the vortex, stretching it, uh, which amplifies the vorticity, and viscosity uh, diffusing the vorticity away. And if those two effects are in balance, then you have a steady vortex. So where does this uh, come up? Well, uh, one interesting example is this thing that I like to call the atom of turbulence. It's a sort of elemental structure that we see over and over again in turbulent flows. You have one or more vortices, more or less parallel to each other, curving around, and in between them are regions of strong strain. The vortices are amplified and maintained by vortex stretching, and that vortex stretching is balanced by the diffusive action of viscosity, which tends to diffuse the vorticity away. So we think Berger's vortex is a, is a good uh, model for things like this, as well as other kinds of vortices in nature. So to derive Berger's vortex, we're going to make, well, there's going to be four main assumptions. And here are the first two. We assume that the flow is homogeneous and incompressible. Homogeneous meaning the density is the same everywhere, and incompressible meaning that the velocity field uh, has no divergence. And of course those two assumptions are, are closely connected to each other. So this leaves us with three, set, three equations. The first is just the condition that the velocity divergence be zero. We label that equation one. Then we have the momentum equation, which has been converted into a vorticity equation by taking the curl. And you've seen how to do that. We label that equation 2. And then in order to close the system, since we have both omega and u in here, then we need a third equation, which is simply the relationship between the vorticity omega and the velocity u. And we label that equation 3. So those are the equations for homogeneous incompressible flow. Okay, so now we're going to look for a particular kind of solution to these equations. Uh, and it's going to be a solution in which there is an extensional strain uh, stretching a vortex, amplifying it by the mechanism of vortex stretching, and there's going to be viscosity tending to damp the vortex out. We'll assume that the vortex is straight, uh, and that will make the math a whole lot easier, and that the vortex doesn't change along its length. Okay. So it's natural to use cylindrical coordinates for a, a problem like this. The, uh, the, the axis of the vortex we'll call the z-direction, and then we define some other uh, coordinate as the x-direction. From any point r theta z, we can drop a perpendicular to the xy plane, and the distance from the, ray, the, the center, the axis of the vortex, to that hypothetical point is labeled r, and then the angle from the x-axis to r is the azimuthal coordinate, theta. Okay. Now, here we make our first really substantive assumption. Uh, which is that W, the vertical velocity, is the simplest form that will have uh, extensional strain. So we assume that W is proportional to the vertical coordinate Z, and the constant of proportionality is gamma. Gamma represents an extensional strain. Um, so now we need to find out what some other components of the velocity field are, like the velocity in the radial direction. And to do that, we write down the divergence equation, div dot u equals zero, only we write it in cylindrical coordinates. And that you can look up, for example, in Appendix B1 of the Kundu et al. textbook. Okay, so we have gamma, once again the extensional strain rate, we have the divergence being set to zero. Now we make our fourth major assumption, which is that the azimuthal velocity only varies with r. And this is, this is another way of saying that nothing changes in the z direction. Okay, we just have a straight vortex tube here. So the azimuthal 
uh, velocity is only a function of r, and if we plug that assumption into divergent, the divergence equal to zero equation, what we get is this. We get 1 over r d by dr of r u r plus gamma equals zero. And that's a differential equation that we can solve. We multiply both sides by r, and then integrate. We get r u r equals negative a half gamma r squared plus some constant of integration. Now, uh, assuming that all of these functions are smooth functions and nothing goes to infinity or anything, we can simply ask what happens at r equals zero. So we set r to zero and find that the constant of integration has to be zero, and we wind up with an expression for the radial velocity, which is minus a half gamma r. So notice that um, W represents an extensional strain, whereas the, uh, the radial velocity, ur, represents a compressive strain because of the minus sign. Notice also the factor of a half, which, uh, which comes about because this vortex is being extended in one dimension but compressed in two dimensions. And so the compression in each coordinate only has to be half as strong. Okay, so what can we tell now about vorticity? Well, um, with the velocity field being the way that it is, the vorticity can only be non-zero in the vertical direction. We've, we've more or less assumed that. So the vorticity is the vertical unit vector e hat z times some scalar function omega, which is only a function of the radial distance r. And if you look up, once again in Kundu, the form of the vorticity in the z direction, you get that it's 1 over r d by dr of r u theta, the azimuthal velocity. So that's great. We have a connection between the vorticity and the azimuthal velocity, but we don't really know uh, what either of those quantities is. So we'd like to, to solve for omega of r, and that's going to be our main job here. So to do this, we'll take the equation we haven't used yet, which is the vorticity equation, equation uh, number two. And since only the z component of vorticity is uh, non-zero here, we'll write down the z component of this equation, d by dt of the scalar omega equals vector omega dot grad z component of velocity, which is w, plus viscosity nu times the Laplacian of omega, the scalar z component of vorticity. Now, given that omega is only a function of r, we can simplify this equation quite a lot. Um, look at the material derivative, for example. It's got derivatives with respect to time and all three spatial coordinates in it, but the only one that is non-zero will be the derivative with respect to r. So that material derivative simply gives us radial advection, the r component of velocity times d omega by dr. The first term on the right hand side uh, is similarly simplified. It's omega dot grad, but um, omega only has a component in the z direction, and therefore it's simply omega d by dz acting on w. So we wind up with omega dw by dz. The third term is a little bit more complicated. We have the viscosity nu, and then we have the Laplacian of omega. And once again, we turn to Kundu's appendix, B1, and find that in cylindrical coordinates, the radial part of the Laplacian is 1 over r d by dr, r d omega by dr. So it's like a second derivative with respect to r, except that it's got these extra factors of r and 1 over r to uh, accommodate the cylindrical geometry of the coordinate system. Okay, so we're getting closer to having something we can solve. Uh, here is that equation again. And notice that the two components of the velocity field, u, r, and w, are things that we already know. And we can substitute 
the known expressions for those. UR is negative a half gamma R, and DW by DZ is simply the constant gamma. Okay, so uh, reproducing that equation here, we have negative a half gamma R d omega by dr equals omega gamma plus viscosity 1 over R d by dr of R d omega by dr. Can we solve this differential equation? Well, this will take several steps, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, what I do here is multiply through by 2R to get the equation into this form, and I took the middle term and brought it over to the left hand side and then took out the common factor negative gamma from these two terms and you'll see in just a second why I did that. When you take out that common factor then what's left is this term in parentheses r squared d omega by dr plus 2r omega and we can recognize that as just the derivative of r squared omega if you use the product rule to split out the derivative of r squared omega into two terms, these are the two terms you get. So we have negative gamma d by dr r squared omega. And now collecting everything up, negative gamma d by dr r squared omega is equal to the right hand side, the viscous term, which is 2 times the viscosity d by dr r d omega by dr. Okay, so this is getting uh, to the point where we can almost integrate it. In fact, we can integrate it. So here we have our, uh, our equation reproduced once again. And now we just integrate both sides and get uh, negative gamma r squared omega equals twice the viscosity times r d omega by dr. That's the the uh, quantity that was inside the parentheses here, and then we get a constant of integration. And once again, if omega is a smooth, well-behaved function, so none of its derivatives go to infinity or anything weird like that, we can find the value of this constant just by setting r to zero, and then we see that the constant of integration is zero. Okay, so now we can proceed from here uh, rearranging this equation a little bit to get it in the form d omega by dr equals this stuff on the right hand side or dividing both sides through by omega we get 1 over omega d omega by dr equals all of this stuff times r and we can integrate both sides of that the integral of 1 over omega d omega by dr is just the natural logarithm ln of omega the integral on the right hand side, we just integrate r to get a half r squared, so the net result is minus gamma r squared over 4 times the viscosity nu, and then we get a constant of integration which we'll just um, immediately identify as the natural logarithm of omega naught, omega naught being the value of omega at r equals 0. So it's like the value of vorticity at the center of the vortex. Okay, so now we've got an equation with logarithms in it. We can take the exponential of both sides, and finally we get the solution. Omega equals omega naught e to the minus a half r over r naught squared, where r naught squared is the square of a radial scale. It's a constant, which is simply an abbreviation for the square root of 2 times the viscosity nu divided by the strain uh, gamma. So this radial scale expresses the competition between the viscosity and the strain to determine how skinny or how fat this vortex is going to be. Uh, plotting omega as a function of r, we get the uh, Gaussian decay of omega away from r equals zero and of course the length scale of that Gaussian decay as we've seen is the constant r naught. What does this mean in physical terms? It just means that well the uh, the vorticity is a Gaussian function of radius shown here in the blue curve 
and if you had stronger strain or less viscosity that would lead to a smaller value of R0. So in other words, if, you, if the strain that's pulling on that vortex and stretching it and amplifying it is stronger, or if the viscosity that's trying to diffuse it is weaker, then you get a, a, a thinner, tighter vortex. Or in the opposite situation, if the viscosity that's trying to smooth out the vortex is stronger, and or the strain that's trying to strengthen the vortex is weaker, then you get uh, a fatter, more spread out vortex. And, uh, and that is Berger's vortex.